So we have postgraduate and doctorate students of Myanmar Sinan University. That was a collective study. Darya Frat Barichanan, Erdan Chamuti, Öykü Gürpınar have conducted this study. So today we have uh, Öykü and Barış. So the title of the presentation is uh, The Memory of Genocide at the Fourth Generation After Genocide in Turkey and Diaspora, a Comparative Analysis of the Young People. We have no more direct witnesses of the Armenian Genocide. I mean, there is no more survivor of the Genocide. So, when we talk about Genocide, we talk about a transmitted memory. So, that's why such a memory needs a conceptualization. We conducted, started to conduct this study last year in June, and we used Meron Hirsch's post-memory concept. Post-memory, well, inflation to an event which constitutes a rupture, is about how it is remembered, not by direct witnesses, but the other people actually who are not direct witnesses. So post-memory is always a process of reconstruction. So it is reconstructed depending on the current situation and the narration is renewed day by day. So post-memory is a multitude of memories. When we say memory, we cannot talk about a single Armenian memory. So it is about actually the memory of each individual Armenian. So on one side, there is a memory which is transmitted collectively, but on the other hand, there is also the individual memory of each individual Armenian. Our objective in this study was to understand the post-memory of the fourth generation after the genocide. So on the basis of the concept of Yish, there is a multitude of memories. We try to understand what happened among Armenians on the basis of their post-memories. So we try to understand the multitude and diversity of the post-memories of Armenians living in different places. So instead of a gross generalization, we wanted to understand how fourth generation Armenians connected with the genocide. So how these post memories differ from each other to understand it, we investigated the historical important uh, turning points, events, and also practices of commemoration in these different locations. So in Turkey, in Lebanon, in France, in Armenia, well, we studied these places and made a comparison between these four locations. So it was important to understand the different dynamics of remembrance, forgetting, settling accounts with the past, also demands in relation to the memory. So we try to understand the differences instead of creating a representative sampling and we try to use an interpretive analysis. So I 
Instead of arriving at conclusions about the demands, identity, and memory of the Armenians, we just want to understand the connection between the memory and identity. During the interview, we asked open-ended questions. It was a semi-structured questionnaire, so we actually skipped some of the questions or changed the questions depending on the course of the interview. As we came from Turkish and as we are tur we were Turkish, the interviews were also directly related to our identity. And the interviews generally asked us whether we actually recognized Armenian genocide or not. And on the basis of this recognition, we could conduct this interview. So we conducted 106 interviews in Armenia, France, Turkey, and Lebanon. The reason we selected these countries was that the Armenia went through a real socialism period during Soviet period. Turkey is the country where the genocide took place and denial still continues, and it has an impact on the Armenians. Now, after that general description, I'll give the floor to Öykü to talk about the content of the study. Hello. I will briefly give you information about the profile of the interviews. We conducted 22 interviews in Turkey, equally divided between females and males. 19 of them were students. So the first column is age, the second one is gender, male female and the last one indicates the total number. In Armenia we conducted 30 numbers. 10 of these was in Suputnik and 20 in Yerevan, 11 men and 19 women. And 9 of the interviewers were students. To make a comparison between Turkey and Armenia, only one of the interviewers that we talked in Turkey, there was someone who actually had experience. There was someone who had not experienced uh, the genocide in their family. In Lebanon, we talked to 26 people. It was in Beirut, 16 male and 10 females. So this was the only country where there were actually fewer men than females, and 12 of these were students. In France, we talked to 21 persons in total, nine male and 12 females. 15 of these were from Marseille, and the remainings were in living in Paris. And eight of the interviewers were students in Germany. It's still going on, so we have conducted seven interviews, and the third met three females. The interviews are going on, that's why we are not we, we have not included it in this presentation. Concerning the historical constitutive event, what we mean by this? In the context of the post-memory, there is an event, a turning point, which contributes to the creation of that memory. There's something which has been brought by the geography, by those circumstances, by that history. So what is that actual constitutive historical event for each location? For Turkey, it was very clear, particularly when talking about fourth generation, it was 19th of January. So, I mean the um, killing massacre of Rantink. In Armenia, in the process of the remembrance, in terms of connection with the genocide, the historical turning point, the constitutive event is mostly the actual breakdown of the Soviet Union. So, it was a rupture before, actually after the collapse of the Soviet Union, and with the Sputnik earthquake and also with the Karabakh war, it also coincided with these events. So when the young people told about this, they frequently referred to these events. In Lebanon, this turning point was actually the civil war that took place in 1975. So it shows us how a traumatic event was merged with another traumatic event in the formation of the memory. In France, so contrary to the actually the historical events that contributed to the creation of the memory, it was the resistance to the Nazi occupation in France. So 
the particularly it was also related to the Hanchekian memory which contributed and participated in resistance to Nazi occupation in France. So because of time constraints and as we have just recently completed the field interviews because we conducted 176 interviews so far in order to we didn't have much time to analyze all the patterns of thought and reasoning. So this presentation is uniquely based on the observations we made in the field studies and also the state of mind. So this is just a comparison of these in the field. Some of these may be considered as actually generalizations that need to be avoided, but we just wanted to share our observations with you. So for this, we had three titles. Me one is the actual information about the genocide. It's about how the post-memory was formulated and created. So what are the main factors that contributed to the creation of the post-memory? The second is the practice of the remembrance and commemoration. And the third one is demands. It means that what kind of an action, what kind of a conduct, what kind of actually, a, well, a movement was put forward on the basis of this. So I would like to make a rapid comparison between these four countries on the basis of these three items. To talk about how we created these tables, on each slide we have Turkey, Armenia, Lebanon, France. You see the vertical columns and on the horizontal axis you see the first encounter with the genocide. The second one is how it was told about in the family. The third one, how it was mentioned in the school. And the fourth one is how it was transmitted in the social environment. So we will compare all this. In interviews in Turkey, the first encounter with the genocide actually was a silent experience as mentioned by one of the interviews. So it is something which is not fully known, but it is something like a ghost, a specter, which is felt, and it comes from the family. So there is something, you feel there is something, but you cannot name it. So it creates a feeling in Turkey. In Armenia, however, it is something like a genetic code. You are, instead of something which is, which is into which you are born, it is something with which you are born together. So to make a comparison between Turkey and Armenia, we see that if we ask when they heard the word genocide for the first time, they have a, well, they have a certain answer, but those in Armenia don't remember when they heard the word genocide for the first time. In Lebanon, concerning the first encounter with the genocide, it generally took place within the community, congregation or the family. In France, it took place at school or during commemoration services. Concerning transmission within the family, In Turkey, there is not a strong transmission within family. The reason is the family wants to protect the children because the parents want to teach children what they can talk and what they cannot talk about. So there are mostly covered narrations in Turkey. In Armenia, however, there are detailed, direct narrations, most of which we have directly listen to during our interviews. In Lebanon, there is a very strong narration. It is very detailed. But it was also mediated by the congregation. In France, however, there is a narration which is not detailed, a weak and ambiguous narration. Actually, most of the interviewers in France don't know what from which province of Turkey their parents were from. So they had heard it once, but they don't remember now it now exactly. So it is socially mediated. As for the transmission at school in Turkey, there is a clear denial. So it is mostly an accidental transmission. One of the interviewers said they, he had noticed that all the, well, writers, Armenian writers had died in 1915, he had asked the question, why did all the Armenian writers in Western Armenia 
die in 1915 and the teacher answered don't ask it to me ask it to your family so the teacher avoided answering the question in Armenia it is of course part of the official history in Lebanon it is part of the political history so depending on which school you are studying it is part of uh, the tradition of whether Hanchekin or Tashnekin in France so it is part of the first and second world war history Concerning transmission from the social environment, in Turkey there is a denial, in Armenia there is a direct social narration, they live in that. In Lebanon there is a direct narration, it mostly happens within the congregation, Armenian community, but not in the whole Lebanon society in France. Actually there are mediated narrations from the social environment, it mostly takes place during commemoration services, so it is considered as a, commit a crime against humanity and dealt with in a more universal manner. Concerning practices of commemoration, so in terms of uh, the relations with the perpetrator and our identity, there are demands for investigation of the origins in France so instead of investigating the personal family history actually the focus is on investigating what happened in 1915 concerning the commemoration of the 24th of April there are different forms of this in Turkey it is only an opposition an opposition not only against uh, what happened during genocide but also against the state tradition in Armenia it said there is an official commemoration service so it's a national official commemoration in Lebanon there is a form of dedication it is influenced by political parties in Fr what I mean by political parties you know Hanchekian, Tashnekian etc in France there is participation but the commemoration takes place more on the basis of universal values so it is more related to international politics in terms of identity being an Armenian in Turkey means being alienated and being actually being a reaction to be marginalized in Armenia, however, it is constant. Well, there is a constant. It, it's an objection to a constant feeling of victimization related to genocide. In Lebanon, however, genocide, well, amounts to the approval of the identity. In France, however, there is an ambiguity caused by being French and Armenian at the same time. Concerning connections with perpetrators, I mean how they connect with Turks. In Turkey, they still have a hope to live together, but even if it is a tense relation that should to which require the contribution of both parties, it is still possible. In Armenia, people say that it is likely to establish a strong contact with Turks, but it is a cautious one. In Lebanon, well, the contact is more limited. As far as we saw, most of the interviews in Lebanese were the, actually said that we were the first Turks they saw in their lifetime. So uh, maybe we were the first Turks who participated on the commemoration of 24th of April. So it was a strange moment of encounter. It was interesting for us to be there. So it seems that there is a certain, well, uh, well enmity feeling. So the teacher said to students, you see these are Turkish people. They are Turkish coming from Turkey, but studying genocide. So he felt the need to make the explanation that not all Turks are the same. From the perspective of France, there is a certain insensitivity. But uh, what I mean is that if you ask the question whether they would connect with Turkish people or not, they would say it wouldn't, ma well, it would be the same. It wouldn't make a difference. So it is not a well valid point. And you see, this shows how demands are distributed. First of all, recognition, compensation, territory, apology, border opening, and also cultural heritage. So there are six categories of demands. All 
all these categories of demands are valid for all the four countries, but there are different intensities of these demands. So this is a matrix of intensity. Which demand is most valid for which location? Of course, recognition is the most important demand which emerges in four countries, which was the final objective. Well, compensation demand was very strong in Armenia, and they justified it by thinking that the genocide caused the nation to lose its wealth. So uh, that was the reason for the economic crisis of Armenia that it goes through today. And demand for territory took place, most interestingly, in Lebanon. Although there is also demand for territory in Armenia, those in Armenia, people in Armenia think it is not very realistic, maybe it is not very necessary. However, those in Lebanon thought that their connection with their identity and cultural heritage was so strong that most of them had visited Turkey at one point in their life or planned to visit Turkey. So the demand for territory was very strong among Armenians in Lebanon. It is about, well, to connect with their origin and connecting with the homeland as well. Demand for apology is specifically valid for Turkey only because Apology was a demand that was mentioned by the Armenians living in Turkey. It is about their hope for continuing to live in Turkey and also putting an end to the marginalization and alienation. Concerning the border opening, so it concerns Armenia and Turkey. So it, it was a demand both in Turkey and in Armenia. It was stronger in Turkey. Some of the interviews in Armenia were more reserved about the opening of the border. Concerning the cultural heritage, I mean the restitution, return of the properties of the Armenians. It was a strong demand in Turkey, likewise in Armenia. So some people said that it might be an alternative to the demand for territory. So that they could uh, reconnect with their past. Finally, as we have time constraints, there are many issues I couldn't talk about right now. We have two websites. One is in Turkish, one is in English. So all the details about the study are being published on the site memory.org or n.memory.org. So you can have access to details of the study on these websites.